and then for today's program um so we're starting um, with some introductions and then have the keynote from jamie and then run through all the different presentations and finish around two o'clock and that's yeah pass back over to you paul thank you very much victoria and uh, thank you to British Hydrological Society, which I'll shorten to BHS, if, that, if you don't mind, uh, for hosting today's call. And welcome again to all of you, uh, a special celebration uh, via five presentations, as you can see on the screen there, of 40 years of the National Riverflow Archive. So let's introduce ourselves. Um, I'm Paul Sadler, and I'm a manager in the Environment Agency, and I'm the current chair of the Surface and Groundwater Archive, or the SAGA Committee. Isabella, are you there? Yes. Hello, Paul. Thank you. Um, I'm Isabella Tyndall, and I'm the manager of the National Riverflow Archive and secretary of the SAGA committee. It's a cross-sector UK committee that oversees the activities of the surface and the groundwater archives, i.e. the National Riverflow Archive and the National Groundwater Level Archive. Yeah, and today forms the second of three celebrations marking this 40th anniversary of the archives. And the first focused on the groundwater archives, and that took place at the Geological Society's May conference. Um, Isabella, I think, I think you had the privilege of attending it, didn't you? Yes, I did, and I enjoyed it and learned a lot. Um, Saga's Andrew McKenzie of the British Geological S Survey presented on 40 years of the um, NGLA. And we also plan a third celebration, which will be an article describing the archives in some sort of professional um, publication. Indeed. Thanks very much, Isabella. So without any further ado, we're delighted to welcome our speakers. As you can see from the programme, we've got Jamie Hannaford of the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. And Jamie will be giving today's keynote speech. Jamie's the, the group leader for the Hydrological Status and Outlooks group, and he's also a member of SAGA. Then we've got Katie Mutchen and Rob Groove from the Environment Agency and Penny Hearn from the Canal and River Trust, who will be providing a, a kind of measuring authority perspective or perspectives on the use of the National River Flow Archive data and the importance of hydrometric data. Then we've got Saskia Solway, who is a final year PhD student at the University of Bristol. And Saskia will be focusing on incorporating reservoir representation into national scale hydrological modelling across Great Britain. And Anthony Hammond of JBA Consulting will follow on um, and he'll highlight the benefits to the scientific advancement of freely available data uh, by describing examples of using NRFA data, in particular the peak flows data set in flood risk management. And Dr. Louise Slater, uh, an Associate Professor in Physical Geography at the University of Oxford, will present a selection of projects developed by her research group that use the NRFA data. Okay, thanks Isabella. So Jamie, thank you very much. Welcome, uh, Jamie, with our keynote speech. Um, so when you're ready, uh, please yeah. begin. We're, we're not being rude, but I will mention that with two minutes to go, that you've got two minutes to go. Absolutely. <laughs> no, no. Hi, hi Paul. Hi, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen then and check everything works as well as it did uh, a couple of minutes ago. Let's see. Sure thing. Yeah. Okay. Good. So that is that all okay? Perfect. Great. Okay then. Right. So, um, well, thank you everyone for um, for joining this webinar. Uh, so, uh, yeah, my my name is Jamie Hannaford. I lead the uh, the, the hydrological status and outlooks group, within which uh, many of the NRFA team members sit. Now, in many ways, I'm less involved in the day to day running of the National Archive, but it still underpins almost everything I do in my work life, certainly in the UK and in many ways internationally. So um, hopefully going to give you a perspective of, uh, you know, the, certainly my experiences of working in the NRFA and reflecting on this, this long um, history of the NRFA and where it looks to go in the future. Um, this is a team effort. Many thanks to the people mentioned on screen who've given material, there'll be others mentioned as I, as I go through as well. Uh, and of course, thanks to the wider uh, NRFA team. So um, I'm perhaps not very well placed to give a view on the beginnings of the NRFA because this was me in the early 1980s when the NRFA first came to, to uh, the Institute of Hydrology. Maybe I can be forgiven for not being aware of the NRFA at this time, but I have been involved in the NRFA since I joined CEH 2001 
So actually, that is over half of the NRFA's lifetime. I joined to work on quality control, moved into analysis, and I led the NRFA for a while. And I now lead the wider work program within, within which the NRFA is situated. So I've seen some incredible changes over this time in what we do and how we do it. So I hope to offer you some thoughts on the, on the, on the past, but especially the present and the future of the NRFA going forwards. The first thing to say is this, there have already been some celebrations of the 40th. In fact, there's already been a cake. So this was the scene from the 40th Saga meeting held in Wallingford earlier this year. Many people in this picture who are on this call, all of whom play an important role in the archives, you'll be hearing more about. No cake today, but certainly an opportunity to broaden our birthday celebrations. So what is Saga? It's already been mentioned and introduced briefly by Isabella. It's the committee that oversees the activities of the archives, the NRFA and its sister ar archives, the National Groundwater Level Archive run by BGS. Now, all of the organisations you can see on screen, uh, you can see HBGS, but also the data providers, the funders, the government bodies, Cyber and BHS and so on, representing the user community, all play a role in this committee and indeed in the archives. And this really hammers home a first important point. These archives are not just the teams working at CEH and BGS, but the sum total of a collaboration across all these organisations and more. And also, it's not just about the SARCA committee, it's not just about the NRFA, but about UK hydrometric data in general. So there's all sorts of benefits to the data providers. Really, this is a collective enterprise to ensure good quality data for a very wide user community, which becomes all the more important dealing with a pressing water crises that we are engaged with uh, in the context of the climate emergency. So a huge uh, collaborative endeavour across many organisations and people. Before going into the rest of the presentation, I want to highlight in many ways, this is not just 40 years of the NRFA. We're in some ways celebrating 90 years of the NRFA. The roots of the archive can be traced back to the Inland Water Survey in 1935, born out of a major of drought event just beforehand. And this timeline summarizes some of the key points in the evolution of the archives. Most crucially for our story is the, uh, the move of the NRFA from the uh, Water Data Unit to the Institute of Hydrology in 1982. That's really the sort of what we're celebrating 40 years of. But of course, there's a much wider and longer term st story here. While I feel a deep connection from my two decades, of course, it's really just a blink of an eye. I can't do it justice in one slide, so I invite you to look at this interactive history on our uh, history timeline on our website to find out more about this sort of deep time of the NRFA and uh, the Groundwater Archive. I also, before really going further, want to reflect on another celebration we had a decade ago. I imagine many on this webinar will remember this in-person, day-long celebration of the NRFA held in Wallingford. Now, my talk today, we will actually revisit some of the reflections we made 10 years ago. In particular, I was charged in my talk with talking about the future of the NRFA. Um, and I, I gave a sort of more serious uh, presentation, but then I finished with my tomorrow's world style prediction at the end of the talk. Um, really closing with this more tongue in cheek sign off saying, looking 30 years into the future, would the machines be doing the work of the NRFA for us? Well, I now bring to you in 2023, somewhat earlier than anticipated, a hydrological summary created entirely by artificial intelligence. As you can see here on screen, we asked ChatGPT to write the hydrological summaries. Steve Turner did this a few months ago. Um, and it's interesting, shall we say. Interesting, but also quite amusing because, so Terry Marsh, who uh, the font of all UK hydrology and hydrometry knowledge, who many of you will know, I'm sure, he wrote every single hydrological summary for the first 20 years and many thereafter. And at his, his retirement, which you can see here in 2016, when he retired, we joked that surely we could get an algorithm to write the hydrological summary. My first point here is who would have thought that in you know, a relatively short time, we'd have large language models producing credible machine produced text by this time. The second point though is if you actually read this, it's credible in a grammatical sense, but factually in a small way, but really it's very, it's garbage. It's uh, completely derivative nonsense and it certainly wouldn't pass a hydrological Turing test. And this is a theme I'll come back to later on at the end of the talk on the realities of technological progress. But this is just to set a bit of context. I'm going to be sort of talking about what's happened over, in certainly over the longer term, but especially over the last 10 years in terms of technological changes, the benefits they bring, but also the challenges. I'll be reflecting on this all the way through. Here's two more slides from my 2013 talk. 
noting the changes from the 80s to the noughties in terms of instrumentation and also making the change between those paper um, uh, paper publications from the early days of the archive through to the apps that were sort of really starting to happen around that time 10 years ago. So I think this reflects the views of that time in 2013, the burgeoning use of earth observation and drones, the early days of social media and apps and so on. So it was a kind of, you know, really exciting time for looking at lots of these technological changes and less exciting ones like Google Glass. But anyway, it really reflected the themes of that time. And I'd like to take this forward into the rest of my talk to reflect on what has changed since then and also um, some thoughts on, on what that means going forwards. I'm going to, the rest of this talk, I'm going to categorise into various um, parts of the hydrometric information life cycle. This is a device we always use in our presentations to show how the NRFA sits in the middle of this wheel and engages at all of these stages of hydrometric uh, data. It's not just about the NRFA being a conduit, getting data out and disseminating it, but engaging at ev every stage from the network design all the way through to the management and decision support. You can see more on this life cycle in this paper here up on the screen. So starting off with the first bit of the life cycle, well, the monitoring and the network design. Now you may think, well, surely that, uh, you know, managing the networks is the role of the measuring authorities. Um, and clearly it is, but the, the archive has always had a role to play in guiding the evolution of the network. When it comes to network design and evaluation, one of the key ways we, we do this engagement is through getting to know the network, through a program of field liaison, getting to know the gauging stations, the catchments, the data, and crucially also the people over many decades. And this accumulated knowledge is really crucial and it's what allows the NOFA to play the role it does in speaking up for the network and its evolution. One of the most successful examples of this is the benchmark network, a collaboration with the measurement authorities to enable us to prioritize some strategically important sites, some of which might not always be of operational value. And this is towards a particular purpose, the particular purpose being trying to detect climate driven changes in river flow. We'll be coming back to the benchmark network later on towards the end of this talk. One of the other ways we're always engaging on the network is really asking the question constantly, how fit for purpose is the network? We've been engaged in the, in, the, in the NRFA with a number of network reviews over the years. Most recently, Kath Sefton and, and, a, and a large team have been working on the natural capital ecosystem assessment with the Environment Agency, developing tools, and there's some examples here on screen, tools to actually understand the representativeness of catchments, their data quality, artificial influences, and so on. Really trying to help make good decisions about the, um, the configuration of the network so crucial given the scale of the investment of the network that we get the most out of the, the network and the data it produces. So now moving on to the next stage, data sensing or monitoring. I joked some years ago uh, when we gave the last presentation, would we even need to, to leave the office at all in future? Um, and of course, I, I made that point refer, saying, would we be deferring our efforts to drones and satellites? Well, things have certainly come on a long way over the last 10 years. This is a slide from Nick Everard. Um, it, talking about a particular project called Fluvisat, which is looking at trying to investigate measuring flows using short videos taken from space. An incredibly exciting time for all these kind of technologies. I asked Nick for some examples and I asked for a slide and I got six. Um, I haven't got time to do it justice because, uh, you know, Nick loves to uh, extol the virtues of these kind of technologies. But really, if you look at the sort of stuff that Nick and many other colleagues are doing, it is, it is incredibly exciting. It's like something from a child growing up in the future obsessed 1980s has a field day over these kind of things. Drones, high altitude uncrewed aircraft, thermal infrared cameras, smartphone apps, there's a whole load of stuff out there revolutionizing flow measurement. But whilst the Earth, sorry, whilst that kind of Earth observation and so on is exciting, one of the biggest other potential areas for armchair hydrologists is the advent of citizen science. We've lagged behind uh, the ecologists in, in many ways on this, I think, but lots of exciting things happening. An example here of Crowdwater, uh, Kath and others uh, looking at the potential of mapping, contracting stream networks in, in this chalk during droughts, combining that with observations from the NOFA and so on and so forth. Huge areas of potential, linking our high quality long-term observations we have on the NOFA with spot observations from uh, many, many sites, albeit with big uncertainties. As with all tech, very profound questions of how these are linked up and in terms of the linked up to existing databases, 
and also around quality control. That moves us nicely onto the next bit of the wheel, quality control. We showed 10 years ago the differences uh, from the 80s to 2013. Um, some things have very much changed, but the principles are the same with you know teams of experts and looking at the data, eyeballing it to look for anomalies. Terry Marsh again here in the 1980s, Katie Mutchen in 2013, who we'll hear from, from shortly. So what's changed up to 2023? Well, in many ways, not so much, except for the fact we can do all this kind of stuff at home now, as Steve shows very ably with his assistant Ollie here in this picture. But what has changed over the last decade, very similar software, but ultimately many improvements in the methodologies, especially for peak flow um, quality assessment. So lots of uh, lots of developments over the last 10 years, but what might happen in future? Again, worth returning to the potential of machine learning and AI. This slide from Matt Fry, highlighting the potential of developing machine learning models using multiple sensor network, using their predictions to target manual quality control and also potentially to automate infilling. This is, of course, hugely exciting, holds a lot of promise. It's unlikely that the individual knowledge of NRFA regional, NEPs, regional reps are going to be supplanted. And there's always questions for how far you can go with these kind of technologies unaided. But clearly, we must address and harness the potential of these kind of methods going forwards. Next up in the wheel is data synthesis and analysis. So obviously, the great majority of the analysis that goes on is done externally by the user community, many represented on, in, on this webinar, I'm sure. And we'll be hearing from several more this afternoon with examples of uses of the NRFA. But we do a lot of analysis ourselves, given our role in sitting on top of this gold mine of data. So the best example, of course, is the National Hydrological Monitoring Programme. Also recently had a 30th birthday, and you can read a bit more on the blog here, um, celebrating uh, the 30 years from the first hydrological summary up to date. Again, uh, the first hydrological summary, interestingly, was born out of a drought in 1988. Um, and so well, looking looking ahead and moving on to where we are now, bookending that is, uh, is the drought of last summer. And I think that gives a good example of how our role in, uh, in, in sort of analysis and reporting continues at pace. So the, 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 the hydrological summaries continue. They look a little bit different, but very similar ingredients. And they've also been since 2013 joined by the hydrological outlook. The nature of the analysis evolves. So here's some examples from the, the, the extreme uh, dry conditions of last summer, where we were looking at the droughts, um, doing all the usual things we do with hydrological summaries, but also using drought indicators to look at the severity of the drought. Looking, you can see on the bottom a uh, bit of the image there, tracking how low flows go using daily updated real time information and making comparisons to major droughts like 1976. So the 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 principles and some of the methodologies change, but really it's the same mission of trying to understand uh, current hydrological status, put it in a long term context. But what about the future of, of sort of uh, analysis? Well, to a degree, I think there's a, much of that future is here already. Ten years ago, we were highlighting the potential of monitoring and early warning systems from other countries. I think now we have some pretty world leading systems here ourselves. You can see uh, the water resources portal and outlooks portal on screen. So one of the things that these represent really interactive tools for exploring data, visualizing and mapping the data. What's crucial about this has been a real democratization. Everyone can do this kind of analysis we do in the in the hydrological monitoring program in real time. Terry wrote uh, every every hydrological summary single handedly for for two decades and we are now a team of four, but really everyone can play this role of looking at the hydrological situation in the same way that we do. So it's really an example of where these kind of technologies are all about enabling the user community to actually do this kind of analysis um, in a much more efficient and much more streamlined way. And these sort of systems will continue to evolve and I'll come back to that right before the end of this talk. So another key um, aspect of analysis is looking at trends. One of the things that I first worked on when I came up here in the early 2000s, asking the question whether the floods we saw at the turn of the millennium were part of a trend. We used the benchmark network. We published a series of papers looking at the evidence for, uh, for trends in river flows. It's fair to say there's a growing confidence in the kind of trends we see. So uh, Storm Desmond is an example here, done some much more updated analysis showing that certainly in some parts of the country, there seem to be fairly compelling 
trends towards increases in flood magnitude over the time scale of which we've seen. So much so that it's great to see that non-stationary non-stationarity is really taken seriously. The work we've been done done here in, in collaboration with JBA and others has fed into um, actually fed into sort of operational guidance and uh, for practitioners on how to do flood risk assessment in a warming world. Also, just to highlight um, the also to highlight how all this stuff is feeding through into international trend analysis too. So the data that's captured on the uh, by the Environment Agency and others on a local scale comes to the RFA and is ultimately feeding its way into many international, European, and global initiatives too. So Two minutes, uh, sorry. No uh, problem. That's, yeah, Thank getting you. right towards the end now. So again, information dissemination uh, historically was done with hard copies. Uh, we were very excited about our website 10 years ago, but it was still relatively limited what you could do. You could only download 200 stations. It was now, of course, a much richer experience, all downloadable, a huge and growing range of metadata to support the user community, a really key resource for many in the hydrogen community. Just like to sort of highlight and pause and unpack quite how remarkable some of this dissemination is in the age of APIs. So I've loaded up the water resources portal here for a catchment in the Berkshire Downs and show how you can layer up river flow, rainfall, groundwater, soil moisture all together in near real time. And actually that I think is an amazing thing. Each one of these elements was hugely complicated only 10 years ago. 20 years ago, it would have taken lots of technical know-how and time to create a catchment rainfall. Now it's all done on the fly and updated in an automatic way using the APIs that the Environment Agency, CEPA and others are exposing, bringing it all together. Uh, this wheel here shows a massive amount of data that's brought together and assimilated in the water resources portal in near real time for users to get. This is definitely the way things are going to continue going. Some examples on the screen here of where it's all about this kind of interoperability, making the NRFA and its products and tools, exposing it in a way that they can be layered up with all sorts of other data sets as well. I won't go into the detail, but this is just showing how the NRFA is uh, being used alongside uh, soil moisture from space and from models, uh, linked up alongside uh, water quality information as well in these demonstrators you can see up on screen. These are just examples, but this is definitely the way that this whole journey of travel is going towards making these data sets accessible, digitally able to be mapped and joined together in space and time alongside other data sets. And the FDRI, that is a, a whole sort of story in itself, but it's going to be a big in investment and initiative over the coming uh, years in hydrology and hydrometry in the UK. And many of the NRFA team are engaged in the FDRI. And I've shown here that the FDRI and the NRFA are both, if you like, have a similar mission in the middle of this hydrometric information wheel engaging at all of these stages of, um, of the data journey. So just to finish, what's it all about ultimately? Clearly, the last bit of the wheel is around supporting decision making. And it's been great to see that some of these things, the, the, the developments in the portals and so on, have led to genuine benefits for some of the management of the recent droughts, for example. Some quotes up on here on screen of how these have been used in practice, but also in policy making. Um, Lots of documents that are put out citing the NRFA, citing all the work that is done using the NRFA data. This was shown 10 years ago, but since then, many more uh, reviews, the resilience review, very many other policy making documents, both in the UK and internationally, that rely on all of these data sets. We'd love to know more about the uses of data, so please do tell us. So this is my last slide. So, what did we say like, 10 years ago? The finishing strap line I said was that. In an era of big data, the NRFA is going to continue to turn data into information. I'd just like to qualify that with thinking about how things have changed over the last 10 years. Uh, in the context of the deepening climate emergency, the age of misinformation and the growing power of AI, all of these things mean that there's never been a greater need for quality control, informed analysis, interpretation, and clear communication, which is all of the kind of things that the NRFA and the, the wider community working on this all strive for. And so it's all about that human factor, all the organizations I mentioned earlier, all the people coming together to support this huge collective um, and collaborative endeavor. Nice little tweet from uh, Trevor Bond here saying about the NRFA, ultimately, you know, that countless people have ultimately used this resource to better our understanding of the world. And I think that's a, a really noble ambition and great to see that we're able to support um, people to ultimately 
to understand and help to manage uh, the, the world of hydrology. So I'd like to leave it there. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Bravo, Jamie. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm not going to say anything more. It was absolutely brilliant. But let's see if we've got any questions for Jamie. Any hands up or indeed anything in the chat? So let's have a look. Has anyone got any questions for Jamie? We've got a couple of minutes. If not, I, I mean, I would just like to say, I, you know, I, I always find these sorts of events truly inspiring. And um, looking back 30 years, 40 years, back to the 30s and, and beyond, and then looking ahead, it's, it's what it's all about, isn't it? Um, we are stewards of, of, the, of the data of the past and of today and of tomorrow, and uh, our descendants will rely on that. And hopefully our descendants will, will also be good stewards. But uh, let's just check. We haven't got any more. Well, we haven't actually got any questions, Jamie. So I think you've covered everything there. Thank you very much indeed. And I think at that point, in that case, um, let's turn to um, measuring authority perspectives, uh, two measuring authority perspectives, the Environment Agency and the Canal and River Trust. So via Katie Mutchen, uh, Robert Grew and Penny Hearn. Um, so if you're all ready, um, please go ahead and share. Um, I will do a warning when you've got a, um, a minute to go, and you'll notice it's a minute to go because Jamie's was the keynote speech. So also the other four presenters have a minute warning. So okay. without any further ado, Katie, after you. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I'm just recovering from reminding myself that that photo that Jamie shared was 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Quite sure how that happened. Um, right, just bear with me while I do a little bit of... Faff of screen sharing. Of course. Um, hopefully that's now slide way round. Perfect. Okay, brilliant. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Katie Much, and I'm an advisor in the National Flood Hydrology Team uh, at the Environment Agency. And as Jamie mentioned, I have previously worked in the NRFA, so I have a good kind of understanding of of how the archive works. Um, and I'm here to provide a perspective from. Uh, the UK's measuring authorities, so covering the Environment Agency, Scottish Environment Protection Agency, Natural Resources Wells, and Department for Infrastructure Rivers for Northern Ireland. Uh, and I'm also joined by Penny Hearn from the Canal and Rivers Trust, uh, and she's going to share some examples a bit later on as well. So uh, during this presentation, uh, we're going to celebrate the last 40 years of hydrometric data and collaboration, which Jamie's touched on a little bit already. Uh, I'm going to use some examples from across the flow regime uh, of how the data are used and then look a bit into the future uh, and what the next 40 years might have in store. So you may think of the UK's measuring authorities uh, as just data providers to the NRFA, uh, but we're also a key data user. Um, so over the last 40 years, um, the NRFA have been, been providing a really vital service uh, to the hydrological, com hydrological community. Uh, allowing access to hydrometric data to users all around the UK and further afield. And in the measuring authorities, we may not rely directly on the NRFA as much now as we did in the past, as we've got access to our own systems a lot better than we did uh, back in the 1980s. But over the last 40 years, it's been an incredibly important tool um, when that data was a lot less accessible. Um, the NRFA have and still provide an incredibly valuable service to us. Uh, by handling thousands of data requests from third parties that would otherwise land uh, with ourselves. Uh, I made a little request to the NRFA and they let me know that they've handled more than 60,000 inquiries manually, so sort of by phone or email, uh, since 2007, and then more than 2 million requests via the website and API downloads. So that's a huge um, service that they've been providing for us. Uh, they offer and they also provide really crucial added value to the hydrometric data that we collect um, by providing an additional layer of quality control. Um, those sort of elements of quality control are kind of scored and assessed every year, and the results are reported back via that SAGA committee, which allows us to kind of track our performance and progress and how uh, the hydrometric network is performing. But having that secondary level of QC is really important. It means we get better data, 
and make better decisions. Uh, it also allows us to kind of defend the process that we have if they're ever challenged. The NRFA also hold a vital place in uh, having a great relationship between themselves and the hydrometry and telemetry staff that we have uh, within the organisations, both at the national and local level. Um, this is really important, provides a really direct link between the archive and those who are collecting the data that it holds. Uh, it allows the h &T staff to get a really appreciation of the wider use of the data uh, and the importance of maintaining its quality. Um, the NRFA are also a key repository of data which predates Whiskey, which is our own hydrometric archive. So this creates much longer flow and level records for activities such as trend analysis that Jamie has covered. Um, there's work ongoing at the moment to look at how we could sort of rescue and reprocess some of these pre-Whiskey records. Uh, and the NRFA have been a really vital collaborator in that exercise. Uh, finally, the NRFA has helped enable a lot of world leading hydrological research that has it in turn had big operational benefits for ourselves uh, within the measuring authorities. And I'm going to provide some examples of that uh, a little bit later on. Uh, this is this would have been a lot more difficult, nigh on impossible, if the data wasn't so well managed and available for the UK uh, in one place. But it's not just about the data. Uh, Jamie's touched on this a little bit. Um, we also need to celebrate such a long-standing collaboration. Um, this relationship is really important, especially when we work with long-term data sets, uh, but it's often something that's undervalued. Uh, we're not talking about kind of a one-off project over the last few years. It's been going for the last 40 years, um, an annual meeting every every year for the last 40 years, um, often complete with cake, <laughs> um, which was a highlight of this year's 40th <laughs> saga meeting. Um, and this relationship helps all the measuring authorities to comply with consistent monitoring principles and to uh, operate on the same standards uh, and ensure that we're always collecting and storing the most appropriate metadata alongside the data. Um, it's also a key forum for ensuring that both low and high flows are considered, um, as often both ends of the hydrological regime can be managed separately uh, within the organisations. So the NRFA and SAGA more broadly provide that really key level of stability and structure uh, in an ever-changing world um, of staffing and structure uh, within other organisations. So as I mentioned earlier, um, having that easy access to national scale data has allowed the research and development of products which we use in daily operational use. Uh, so I'm going to look at a water resources example first. Um, looking at Cube, the most recent version of the low flow estimation software, uh, which is built on the foundation of the strong relationship and data that's developed over the last 40 years. So for those who aren't aware, which admittedly is me a little bit, um, I sit on the flood side of the business. <laughs> so I'm hoping there's any Cube questions that Rob is on the call and can answer. Um, Cube models impounding reservoirs, abstractions, and discharges uh, to produce both natural and influenced flow statistics and produces time series of flow data at any point on any river. So to generate these statistics that you now get in Cube could take a hydrologist a considerable amount of time uh, if it was done manually, and that's assuming that they have access uh, to all the base data readily available. But in Cube, uh, it takes less than a minute with a few mouse clicks on a good web-based browser tool, and it stores the location so that if somebody else were to come back and look at the analysis, uh, they can ensure that it could be replicated in the same location using the same methods. So it's making really good steps in providing a standardized and consistent methodology for kind of routine hydrology work. And as I say, none of this development would have been possible uh, without the easy access to the data uh, and that relationship that we've had built up over the last 40 years. Uh, the other end of the hydrology, hydrological regime uh, for flood risk, um, access to the quality control peak flow time series that are hosted on the NRFA uh, and the flood estimation research more widely um, at UKCEH support the delivery of huge key areas of operational flood risk uh, work within the measuring authorities. So the data and the methods allow us to generate, for example, the 100 year or 1% flood which is put through a hydraulic model and then produce the inundation maps like you can see on the top right, or can produce depths uh, that we can use to work out what depth of water needs to be defended in flood schemes like those shown on the top left. Um, we also use the data and methods in a kind of more near real time context during an ongoing flood event 
uh, we might be asked to assess uh, the severity or assign a, assign a return period or AEP value uh, to an individual event that's currently ongoing. And as I've mentioned earlier, the NRFA hold uh, generally longer records than we have within our own archives. And it's these longer records that are really important when we're looking at uh, trend analysis or looking at non-stationarity. Um, and in certain cases uh, here in the agency, we ask for this non-stationary analysis that Jamie touched on a little earlier to be completed as part of the kind of standard flood frequency calculations for scheme design. So having the data and the science and the research all available has been a huge advantage uh, for those activities. So I'm just going to hand over to Penny for uh, a couple of examples from Canal and River Trust. Thanks, Katie. So just um, building on from those long trends analysis, I'm going to talk about uh, one of our gauges that we use. Um, but first of all, I'm Penny Hearn. and I work within the water management team at Canal and River Trust. And for those of you who don't know much about the trust, we look after 2000 miles of canal and river cor corridors and 72 reservoirs. We have our own network of hydrometric data stations. And as a measuring authority, we share that data with other regulatory authorities and interested third parties. But we also use the hydrometric data collated by some of the measuring authorities that we've heard about today to manage our own water resources and flood risk. We have an operational duty to keep the canal networks open for navigation, but we also have to meet the statutory environmental responsibilities that come with that. And the hydrometric data is really important in the decision making process of how we manage that water resource across all our waterways. So if you can just go to the next slide, please, Katie. OK, so this is Wendover Springs gauging station in Wendover. It's south of Aylesbury in southern England, and it's thought to be the earliest surviving stream flow monitoring site in the UK. It's managed by Canal and River Trust, but you can access the data from the NRFA website and it records the daily flow downstream of some emerging groundwater springs called the Wendover Springs. And it's got a topographical catchment of just under 10 kilometers squared, which you can see on the map. And the outflow of the Wendover Springs is used to supply the Wendover arm of the Grand Union Canal. So if you could just go to the next slide, please, Katie. Okay, so the Grand Union Canal links London with Birmingham. It's the Trust's longest canal on our network. It's about 137 miles long, has over 158 locks. And when it was built, the Grand Union Canal had water supply problems. So in 1797, a navigable feeder was built between Wendover, which is in the south of that picture, to Tring. So the Wendover arm is that dark blue line. Thanks, Katie. And the feeder diverted the water of the Wendover Springs away from its natural flow path to supply the Grand Union Canal. And the clever Victorians decided to keep a record of flow in the Wendover arm. So our data that we collect at the Wendover Springs gauge is enhanced by an extra 182 years worth of data. And that early data set provides a really unique insight to the hydrological variability during Victorian times. And this long-term data set is one of the first to be released via the NRFA, NRFA's long-term records initiative. So it's a great resource to have. Um, if you can just click again, please, Kate, it just zooms in a little bit. So I'll tell you a little bit about where the water is actually going and how it's used. So at the moment, the water is taken from the Wendover Springs into the Wendover Arm, and then that's transferred into Wiltstone Reservoir. And here it's got two options. It can either go in a northerly direction into the Aylesbury Arm of the Grand Union Canal, or it can be pumped into the Tring Summit Reservoirs Group, which is that collection of three reservoirs on the screen on the screen and the water from the Tring summit group is then transferred into the Grand Union Canal and that provides a consistent and a really vital water supply. As a trust we have to keep a really close eye on the water balance volumes of what's coming into Wiltstone Reservoir from the Wendover Arm and what's being pumped into the Tring summit reservoirs group and then what's leaving that reservoir group to supply the GUC. And simply, if more water is being pumped out of Wiltstone Reservoir than it's coming in from the Wendover Springs, you're going to get a decrease in the reservoir levels. And that's why the long term data set at Wendover Springs is just so important, because when we've got periods of low flow, we can look at that instantaneous flow data at the Wendover Springs gauge against the long term 182 years worth of data 
and it gives us an insight into the current hydrological situation. And I think the average gauge record for most of the NRF ga NRFA gauges is about 40 years compared to this 182 years. So it's really important. And the Trust have got hydrometric data gauges, not only at Wendover Springs, but also on our Turing Reservoir Group feeder outflows and on the GUC. And that's shown by those little black circles with like the white star symbology in it. And the data that comes out of each of those gauges helps our operational staff determine how much water to pump, how to manage the releases into the Grand Union Canal. So it's just uh, bring home really how important the NRFA data sets are. So thanks, Katie. I'll hand back to you. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, we've kind of had a look over um, some of the uses of the data that we've had uh, in the past. So now I'm going to have a look. Um, forward into the future. Uh, we've spent you know, the last 40 years developing this really important relationship. So we need to protect that, but we need to have a look at kind of how we could evolve that, um, which presents some opportunities and risks um, that I've highlighted on here, which are by no means an exhaustive list. Um, and I'm definitely not here to provide solutions to all of these, um, but some of them uh, conversations around these topics um, are ones that we've already kind of started thinking about. So, the significant opportunities presented in the future, and as I say, some of those are starting to be realised, open data being the obvious and big one, um, which is now allowing uh, in England uh, certainly access to sub-daily data, which has been previously very hard to get hold of. Um, but it does present some risks. Um, how do we manage uh, kind of measuring authorities gradually getting greater capability to disseminate their own data um, when the sort of the service provided by the archive that has been going uh, for the last 40 years. Um, we're creating multiple sources of data. So users begin to wonder uh, kind of where should I go um, for the sort of data I need for my particular purpose. Um, a lot has changed as Jamie highlighted in the last 40 years with new types of data and new technologies for monitoring hydrometric data. Um, but again, can we look to the possibilities of AI and machine learning on the data processing and analysis side? Um, I had a little bit more luck with chat GPT, um, writing that fun little limerick, um, which I won't read out for you, but you can have a read on the screen. Um, and then a more specific one that um, SEPA kindly provided to me when I was preparing the slides um, with their recent experience of their cyber attack. Uh, the value of the NRFA um, was really understated um, because the NRFA had the store of station data and metadata uh, most of which was lost um, when SEPA had their cyber attack. So having that kind of resilient extra source and backup um, has been a really important feature that um, we shouldn't take for granted. So I'm just going to finish um, with some quotes that got sent to me when I was preparing the slides from colleagues around the measuring authorities, um, which again, I won't read out because they're quite long, um, but I have highlighted some kind of keywords in there that I think really sum up um, kind of the use of the data and the importance uh, of the NRFA over the last 40 years. Uh, so I'll leave those up there if you want to have a read um, and say here's to the next 40 years. Thank you very much, Katie. And thank you very much, Penny, as well, and, and Rob and all the other contributors to the presentation there. Wonderful. Um, do we have any questions in the chat or, or any hands up? No, no one's been brave. <laughs> That's fine by me. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. And well, like again, I mean, some fascinating um, observations there. Um, the 182 years from Penny of the the record at Wendover, um, and all the various service benefits from a environment agency perspective that the NRFA um, gives as well. So. Great stuff, and I, I think what we'll do is we'll keep we'll keep going, and um, we'll, we'll we'll go on to the next um, the next set of presentations if that's okay. But again, brilliant presentation so far, and really really fascinating, inspiring. So thank you very much. So um, Isabella, can I hand over to you next, please? Yes, certainly. Thank you very much, Paul, and very big thank you to. Uh, the measuring authority team it was a wonderful presentation um so next up we have um saskia Salway from the university of bristol 
So again, uh, Saskia, if you're ready to share your screen, then please go ahead and uh, sure. we'll enjoy your talk. <laughs> awesome. Right, can you see that okay? Yes, I can. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. Um, my name is Saskia. Uh, I'm a final year PhD student at the University of Bristol um, and I've spent the last three years working on incorporating reservoirs into large-scale hydrological modelling across Great Britain. Um, and I'm just going to talk to you today briefly about some of my research and the role of NRFA data um, in that. So as I'm sure many of you already know, reservoirs play a vital role in the supply and management of water resources and their operation can significantly alter downstream flow. So here in Great Britain, we have a lot of reservoirs. The UK reservoir inventory contains 273 reservoirs. 76% um, of these are designed for water resources. Um, and if you look at the plot on the left, you'll see those are distributed across England, Scotland and Wales. Uh, and 9% of the reservoirs are designed for hydropower and these are clustered up in Scotland. Uh, and the reservoirs in this data set have a total capacity of 6,652 million cubic meters, and they were almost all built before 1980. Uh, so yeah, as I said, the reservoirs are really important for water supply, but also for energy production, uh, and they have a large role to play in managing floods and droughts. Um, but despite this, reservoir representation is rarely included in large scale modeling across Great Britain. Uh, there are several reasons for this. So reservoir operations are usually unpublished. It's really difficult to get our hands on them. Uh, individual reservoirs also each have their own policies, uh, so it can be quite site specific. And we don't have the data to describe pre and post or up and downstream flow. So generally, we just don't really know much about how reservoirs are impacting the flow regime. Um, and as a result, model simulations in these catchments are missing some, some key processes. And this is really nicely demonstrated by the plot at the bottom of this slide. So in red, you can see the flow simulated by a hydrological model that doesn't have any reservoir representation. And in black, you can see the flow from the NRFA gauge uh, just downstream of the reservoir. And what you can see is that basically the hydrological model doesn't do a brilliant job of recreating some of the like distinct components of the reservoir hydrograph. So you can see a lot of plateaus and consistent releases and some peaks that without the reservoir representation, um, our hydrological models are just yeah not really able to, to recreate. Uh, so my PhD can broadly be split up into three chapters. Uh, in the first one, I look at how and where reservoirs are impacting the flow regime. In the second one, I develop some uh, generic reservoir operating rules to simulate these water resource reservoirs in large scale hydrological modeling across Great Britain. Uh, and in the third chapter, I look at whether or not operations at water resource reservoirs can be designed to mitigate flood risk as well as facilitating water supply. Um, but fundamentally, each of these chapters, uh, they, they couldn't be done without the NRFA data. I use it every single day. My browser is currently just lots of tabs of different gauging stations. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really important in my work. Uh, and today, just because of time, I'm just gonna talk about some work that I've done in the first two chapters. So when I started my PhD, I knew that the end goal was to incorporate these reservoirs into uh, large scale hydrological modeling. Um, but what I didn't know was specifically how reservoirs were impacting stream flow across Great Britain. Um, so I wasn't really sure in which catchments the reservoir representation was going to be important. It wasn't very clear how reservoir impacted stream flow specifically varied from like an otherwise natural regime. Um, so it was difficult to know like what I was telling the reservoir module to do, basically, how I was going to improve things. Um, so when you want to understand how a reservoir is altering flow, it's really common to look at upstream versus downstream gauge records or to have like a really long flow time series and look at the, the portion from before the reservoir and the portion from after the reservoir to work out like what it's actually doing. Um, but we don't really have the data to do that in Great Britain. Um, so to kind of overcome this, what we did for my first research chapter is created a suite of hydrological signatures, um, which use downstream NRFA flow data, uh, downstream of reservoirs, um, to basically infer how and where reservoirs are impacting the flow regime. Uh, so five like examples of the signature are on the slide below. They look at each different components of the flow regime. Um, and what we did is we calculated these signatures in two samples of catchments. So the first sample was um, from the UK benchmark network. So our assumption was that these were like near natural catchments with minimal human influence. 
Um, and the second sample was uh, any catchment that has a, a reservoir upstream of an NRFA gauge. And then we calculated these signatures um, in the two samples of catchments and used the kind of variability in the benchmark or natural catchments to determine some thresholds. So when the signature exceeds these thresholds, we consider the reservoirs to be having a significant impact on um, downstream flow records. So there's an example of one of the signatures here on the slide. Um, this signature looks at the segmentation of the flow duration curve. So um, what I found is that when I was looking at the flow duration curves at all these gauges downstream of reservoirs, uh, they often looked a bit different from what you would expect. So um, in plot A here on the screen, you can see like a nice kind of as expected natural looking flow duration curve. Um, but in B, it has lots of little steps. In C, it has a couple of plateaus and in D, it's just like this massive plateau at the bottom. Um, and C and D are kind of classic flow duration curves that we find downstream of reservoirs. So um, what this signature does is it quantifies like the deviation between our best guess at a natural shape of the flow duration curve um, and what we actually see at the downstream gauge. So um, if you have a look at the plot on the right, on the y-axis is the signature value, uh, the one that quantifies this deviation. And on the x-axis uh, is a reservoir catchment descriptor. So throughout this piece of work, another thing we did is um, we defined these catchment descriptors, which were really useful for explaining and predicting the magnitude of flow alteration. Um, so what you'll see in the plot on the right is that as these descriptors, uh, normalized upstream capacity and contributing area get higher, we also see larger signature values. And the descriptors basically describe the size of the reservoir with respect to the size of the catchment um, and also how close the gauge is. So an estimation of how much impact there might be. Uh, and in gray on this plot is the, uh, you can see just on the left is the results, the signatures from the benchmark network. So you can see that the variability caps off uh, at a certain point in that sample and above that, that's where um, we see these kind of funky flow duration curves and the signatures picking up, uh, picking that up. Uh, so there was another kind of useful component to these signatures, which is that they can be used to uh, infer upstream reservoir operating rules. So as I said, these are not publicly available. Um, so it's really useful when we can kind of guess at what they're doing. So in this specific example, the plateaus in the flow duration curves uh, can be sort of directly read off. And we understand those to be routine releases like the compensation flow basically. So um, using the signatures and after my first chapter, I had like a much better idea of how and where reservoirs were impacting the flow regime. Um, and I moved on to trying to integrate this reservoir representation into a hydrological model. Um, this isn't new, lots of other studies have done this elsewhere, but usually people are looking at uh, much larger reservoirs than we have in the UK and usually those designed for irrigation. So if you look at the two pie charts on the screen, um, the grand database, which is the one on the left, is like the global reservoir and lakes database. Um, and you can see that globally uh, there are, well, the, 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 there are most reservoirs that fall into the irrigation or hydropower category. Um, whereas in the UK, we mostly have reservoirs designed for water supply. So it became kind of quite apparent from the beginning that there probably weren't any pre-existing rules that really suited our situation um, in, in the UK. So as part of this chapter, we've defined some new really simple rules that are a bit more uh, tailored towards water resource reservoirs in Great Britain. Uh, and just a little technical note for anyone that's interested, the way we've integrated the reservoirs is really, really simple. Um, we have a series of reservoir nodes which break up the river network at reservoir outflows. So the water comes in, the model inflow comes in, it's used to fill a hypothetical bucket that is the reservoir. Uh, and then the operating rules look at how full the reservoir is basically and decide how much water um, is going to be released downstream. So um, the initial results of this are quite good. Um, and what we do is we use the NRFA data uh, at these downstream gauges to evaluate how good the model is. Uh, so on the screen here is an example from a gauge just downstream of Hawes Water Reservoir. The gauge is basically at the outflow, so it's really, really impacted. Um, and in the plot on the right, at the top in red, you can see the flow simulated by a hydrological model that doesn't have reservoir representation. So it's a very responsive regime. Um, and it looks, I suppose, as you would expect a natural catchment to look. Um, but at the bottom in blue, you can see the observed flow at the gauge uh, and it looks, well, pretty different. Um, it has these really flat plateaus where it's just the compensation flow being released and then some spills in the winter when the reservoir is full. 
And in the middle in green, you can see the results from our model with these new operating rules. Um, it's not perfect, but it's a lot better. Um, we're kind of having that we're seeing the compensation flow and the spills happening in the hydrograph now. Um, and yeah, our initial results from this we're pleased with because we've really taken a very simple approach to representing the reservoirs and um, it's made some fairly like significant gains in performance at these gauges. Um, so yeah, just to sort of reiterate and summarize, um, NRFA data has been really crucial to all my work. Um, it's enabled us to have this new understanding of the impact of reservoirs on flow regimes across Great Britain. Uh, it's also informed the development of the reservoir operating rules that we're now using in national scale hydrological modeling. Um, and it has allowed us to evaluate the robustness of our modeling results. And we hope to use them for uh, climate impact projection uh, and lots of other applications in the future. So yeah, that is all from me. Oh, thank you very much, Saskia, for your super talk there about reservoirs. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't realise there were so many in the in Great Britain. <laughs> so I wonder if we have any questions for you um, in our chat. Yes, um, Jamie, I think, has just written one. Uh, Jamie, do you want to come online and uh, tell us your question? Sure. Um, yeah. So, so I um great great presentation. And I I read the paper you did on that, Saskia, and I thought it was a really really smart way of looking at um trying to detect um impacts because it can always be really tricky to do that. But through comparing to benchmark catchments, you've got a really good framework for doing that. And I just wonder whether you think that could be applied for other types of anthropogenic impacts on flow regimes as well. Yeah, I think it. I think it definitely could. Um, yeah, um, yes, I think we could look at, um, yeah, a, a lot of different things, maybe like discharges and, and uh, yeah, as long as there's an impact on the downstream gauge, I like to think there will be a way to quantify it. <laughs> Ray Stouse. Thank you very much. Um, and also Trevor Johnson's uh, written a little note here. Trevor, do you want to um, introduce yourself? Hi, uh, Saskia and everyone. I work within the Wessex Operations team in the Environment Agency. Um, I was just wondering if any of these outcomes or techniques could be used for local modelling within the Bristol Avon catchments. Uh, we've got a flood storage reservoir, as you may know, on the Bristol Froome, and that's actually um, having a study undertaken at the moment on that. Yeah, I think I think definitely. Um, the approach we've taken is quite uh, like large scale because the aim was always to do national scale modelling. Um, so. I suppose like if you were trying to model a couple of specific reservoirs, then you might want a little bit more detail than we've got at the moment. But the the kind of integration of the reservoirs into the modeling is definitely applicable in yeah, anywhere really, anywhere that we have data. Thanks very much. Oh, well, thank you very much. There were a couple of um, other things in the chat earlier about statistics, which um, Stephen Turner has answered and some nice comments. And Duncan Faulkner has um, put it up a, a question if anybody wanted to answer in the chat. But for now, I think we need to move on. And I'd like to introduce Anthony Hammond, who's going to speak to us next. He's from JBA Consulting. So Anthony, if you're ready, please um, share your screen. Yeah, uh, hold on just a second. I'll try and do that. Uh... <clears throat> okay. Yep, it's on its way. Can you see that? I can indeed, yes. Excellent. Okay. Um, yes, so I'm going to talk about um, the importance of what the National River Flow Archive represents. And I'm going to start by saying that um, statistics is the foundation of civilization because it's the backbone of administration, science, medicine, and technology. So uh, if you think that's a bold claim, how about this? Uh, the very fabric and matter of the universe is statistical because subatomic particles are uh, stochastic in nature. So, i.e., uh, or in short, statistics is everywhere and everything. And therefore, um, Statistical methods are very useful for understanding the world around us, but we can't do statistical methods without data, of course. So uh, data can be used to answer uh, very important questions, political ones like this. I'll get on to hydrology in just a second. Um, 
I put this up there to highlight the Office of National Statistics, which is an independent body which holds all this data. So when a journalist or a politician uh, starts uh, stating facts, uh, we don't have to take their word for it. We can, we can look up the data, find out the answer for ourselves. And the National River Flow Archive can uh, do the same thing for hydrology. A very simple example is um, uh, my brother-in-law, Paul, who's a keen wild swimmer and uh, his father. They're having a question about, they're arguing about uh, two rivers in Cambridgeshire and which had the highest flow. That sounds made up, but it's uh, true. Um, and I said, have neither of you heard of the National River Flow Archive? And they shook their heads. So uh, I was able to open up the National River Flow Archive. We looked at the rivers, the data was there. Uh, and hey presto. So the gist is, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. So there's a good quote for you. Um, now, many of you have probably heard this story, but here we have on the left-hand side, Peter Hammond, and on the right-hand side, Ashley Smith. And they live on the river Windrush, which is a tributary to the upper Thames. And uh, over the 20 years or so that uh, Peter's been living there, he noticed that the uh, flora and fauna had been diminishing. And being a computational biologist, he created a machine learning algorithm that allowed him to see when sewage was being dumped into the river. Now, um, at times of uh, peak capacity and loads and loads of rainfall, sewage works have a, uh, a bad choice. Um, uh, and they, they can either uh, let it back up through um, the system, the drainage system, or release it into the, the river. Uh, the latter is permitted at times of high capacity when there's loads of rainfall. Uh, but Peter's work and Ashley's work found that um, uh, sewage was being dumped in the local river when there was no rainfall the day before or the day of the dump. And then they expanded this study and looked at the, uh, the same thing in uh, Wales and England and found that it was happening everywhere. Uh, so this is a proper whistleblowing study which required data. And do you know where they got their uh, catchment rainfall data from? The National River Flow Archive, freely available uh, for a whistleblowing study in the EU. So on a uh, more day-to-day um, uh, -day use of the data, um, stuff that I was sort of doing, um, the, you probably know that the National River Flow Archive releases every year the annual maximum peak flows for over 900 gauges across uh, the UK. And this data, along with the flood estimation handbook methods is used by companies like JBA Consulting or Environment C, CEPA, et cetera, to answer two fundamental uh, questions. Uh, the first one being, gosh, that was a big flood. How often is that likely to happen? Uh, and the second being, how big is the flood going to be uh, every n years on average, or 100-year you know, flood, etc., or the 50-year flood? So let's have a quick look at uh, how we can do this with, with freely available data. So if we look at the top left-hand uh, side here, the, the top left, um, we've got the, a screenshot of the river levels on the internet from the Environment Agency. And this is uh, for a gauge on the River Eden at Sheep Mount, which is in Carlisle. And it says at 5.2 metres, we can expect uh, property flooding. So we can then say, well, how often is this going to happen? We can look at the um, National River Flow Archive uh, site and um, find the annual maximum series from this gauge, which I've got on the uh, bottom left here. Ooh, sorry, I don't know, I don't know what's happened. There we go, sorry. Uh, anyway, I've sorted that data and you can see that 5.2 meters uh, in the stage column is between the ninth and the 10th highest flow that's been recorded in this annual maximum series. So we can do a simple uh, calculation of return period. The reciprocal of 9.5 divided by 55, because that's the number of years available, uh, is five to six years. So we can say on average, uh, Carlisle might flood every six years or so. And uh, the other question, we can use um, the flood estimation handbook methods with uh, freely available tools such as the UKFE R package and uh, results from this gauge are on the bottom right hand corner. And we can see that the 100 year flow is approximately 1,500 meters cubed per second. So we can see that the 2005 January event was approximately a 100 year flow. And uh, similarly, the, the, the highest event, which was uh, December 2015, was approximately a 200 year event. And we don't need to um, uh, limit ourselves to single site analysis. We can ask questions such as how often will Carlisle, Doncaster and Exeter experience some property flooding in the same year? So for this talk, I, I uh, got data from the National River Flow Archive for these sites and I put them in, I ran through the, the MEM tool, which is the uh, multi -event, multivariate event modeling tool created by JBA for the environment, see, but anyone can use it. 
and it allows you to simulate thousand thousand years of events and you can use simple maths like we showed in the last slide to answer questions like this and in this case i think for for how often in a single year i got uh, once every 50 years these um on average these places are going to flood together uh, but once um all on the same day i got 300 to 500 years on average there we go so this is all um very uh sciencey um and we can't really do science without data and one of the tenets of uh science uh, or the scientific method is reproducibility and the reproducibility crisis has been uh, well documented uh, of late uh, and there's a number of reasons why um, a scientific study might not be reproducible one of which is available data and um the beauty of doing a uh, scientific study with the National River Flow Archive data is the, the writer only needs to say something along the lines of, um, I used uh, NRFA peak flow data set number 10, um, or version 10. And uh, then anyone can, if, if you've you know, written out the methods uh, appropriately, anyone can access that data and recreate the results um, independently. Science also benefits from diversity. We often hear about diversity in the workplace and about how uh, a more diverse uh, workforce uh, provides more ideas, more innovation, which is better for everyone, and science works in the same way. And open data does this too. So the, the, the more easy to access the data is for the greater sample of the population, the more diverse the people are who access that data, and therefore more ideas, more innovation, more questioning, more reproducing of, of studies and improvement on studies, and the faster science progresses. And the data from the uh, National River Flow Archive is uh, very easy to access. It's got a very uh, good looking website and it's intuitive. And there's also an R package called RNRFA, which is very good and allows you to bulk download NRFA data. We're probably a bit um, complacent in this uh, country because of the ease of getting data, but uh, just try getting annual maximum data from any other country in the world. It's either uh, quite tricky or not available at all. So. We're very lucky to have the NRFA in that respect. But it's not all um, uh, work and science and stuff. We can have fun with the uh, data too. I have a couple of boys who like playing um, top trumps. They have sonic top trumps and um, dinosaur top trumps and stuff. So I said I'd make them uh, a, a better version, a river's top trump for Great Britain. So I did so and I used um, uh, NRFA data primarily, the maps, uh, the background mapping was OS data, but uh, I, I created five categories, got area, rainfall, mean flow, flashiness, which was based on the mean flow, and flood hazard, which was the percentage of the uh, catchment within the 100-year uh, flood hour. Unfortunately, um, my boys uh, are tired of playing this version and uh, I don't want to play another version, so they, they don't want to play with me anymore. Um, and as an amazing quiz, uh, after I uh, told my colleague James Malloy about this, he went to the Flood Modeler Pro conference and uh, Jacobs in cahoots with Wallingford Hydro Solutions had had the same idea and produced their own decks and they were giving them out at the conference. So I now have uh, two river top trumps that my boys uh, don't want to play with me. So um, anyway, in conclusion, um, free and easy to access data can do everything from highlighting foul play to progressing science at a faster rate. And NRFA fulfills a very important role in this respect. And when considering the river data availability in other countries, we're very lucky to have the NRFA. Um, and recently we've got uh, lots of initiatives like the Environment Agency's Open Hydrometric Data and CEPAs, we've got CEDA Archive and the CAMEL data set. Uh, so essentially the, the, the future looks bright because we've got more and more freely available data. Uh, and for being the vanguard of this for 40 years, we can thank the National River Flow Archive. Thank you very much. Oh, Anthony, that was super. Thank you very much for your, I don't know, glowing report. <laughs> and I do love top chumps. I haven't seen that yet. <laughs> so maybe I should get it for my girls. Anyway, do we have any questions uh, for you, Anthony? I wonder, I'm just going to look in the chat uh, and see if there are any hands up. Um, I think you might be lucky if you consider no questions lucky. <laughs> um, but that was, yes, a, a super presentation about um, how you use the, the NRFA data and others. So uh, it's a very good time, I think, to move on now to uh, our final speaker, Louise 
Um, and you are there, I see, ready and waiting. So thank you very much. And I'll just try and share my screen. There we go. Can everybody see that OK? I can indeed. Thank you. It, it's really a pleasure to be here with all of you today to celebrate the NRFA. Um, we've been using these data for quite a long time now. And I must say, it really is an invaluable resource, in our case, for understanding how flood risk has been changing in the past and into the future. So what I'd like to do is just take a few examples from different aspects of work that we've done using the NRFA data. And I'm going to start with Oxford, because we tend to see a lot of large floods here. And to understand how floods are changing, we need to be looking at the data. So if we look at the gauges that we have upstream and downstream from Oxford, we're lucky because a couple of them at least have nice long records, even though they have been discontinued, I think. And if we look at the days we're gauge in particular, we have 80 years of data here, which we can interrogate. And it's a nice looking gauge out in the countryside with this nice long record. And if we plot those flows over time, we can see that the largest daily flow um, in every year has been increasing since the 1960s. So the immediate impression that we get from looking at these data is that floods have been increasing over time. So here we're looking at the 100 year flood event, um, which is the 1% chance of occurrence in every individual year and how that might be changing over time. But if we extend those records further back into the future, we get a completely different um, image here of what might be happening. And we even get a, a slightly negative trend, probably not significant, but we can see that the importance of having those long records to really get the bigger context and the bigger picture. What we can do is let the data really speak for themselves and see if there are any oscillations in those data, because it's quite well known that large scale climate variability tends to affect river flow in many gauges across the United Kingdom. So here, this may be related to the North Atlantic Oscillation, which is driving a lot of uh, oscillations in data across the UK. But what we see are these flood rich periods in the 1940s and 50s and again in the last 20 years and so a flood poor period right in the middle of, the, of that series in the 1970s and 80s. So this is something that we're really interested in is understanding how we switch between these flood rich and flood poor periods. And we can take that analysis a bit further by thinking about return periods. So if we look at what would have been a 100 year event in, in the 1960s, in 1965, that's about 240 cubic meters per second here. And we look at the return period, so that's a 100 year return period in 1965, and see how that might have evolved by 2015 using statistical analysis, which obviously have all kinds of caveats, which I won't go into. And depending on how you do your analysis, you will get slightly different results. And depending on the record length, you'll get different results. But we can see that at this particular gauge, what might have been a 100 year event might now be a 12 year event on average. And so we can start to look at how floods might be changing across the UK by applying these types of analyses, looking at different event sizes and different locations and seeing how these flood return periods might be changing over time, how they might be 50 year return periods back in the 1970s and now um, 10 year return periods in some cases. And we can plot these changes, both in terms of the magnitude of how the flows are evolving and in terms of the re return period. And this is something very similar to the work that Jamie was presenting because they published all of the first papers that were looking at trends in river flows across the UK. Here, this is looking at the high river flows. And we know that we have this patchwork of increases and decreases in different parts of the UK with, with our increasing changes in river flows in, in the northern UK and, and, and decreases uh, more there in the, in the east. But really a, a mix which implies that we have different drivers, the drivers operating at different scales at the, at the global scale, at the regional scale and at the local scale as well when we're looking at land cover effects and water management and the reservoirs that Saskia was presenting earlier. So we can also look at how the return periods might be changing. And again, this is all to be taken uh, with a pinch of salt, because depending on how you apply the methods and the types of assumptions you make, you will get slightly different results. But we can see that in many places, what might have been a 50 year flood in the 1970s might today be a five or 10 year flood in, in many locations. So these analyses are helpful to understand how risk or hazard is evolving in different places. And I'd like to, to move on to a, a Another piece of work, which is moving from understanding how floods have been changing in the past to understanding how they might evolve in the future. And the common thread here between these two pieces of work is this idea of flood rich and flood poor periods, because we were interested in saying, how are floods likely to evolve in the coming years? If we know that we switch between flood rich and flood poor periods based on climate variability, is this something that we might actually be able to predict? 
So here what we did is we looked at a large ensemble of climate predictions um, from CMIP, from CMIP 5 and CMIP 6. And these are decadal predictions. So they're not, most people are familiar with CMIP for the, the long-term projections, the scenarios. But here we're, we're focusing on the initialized decadal predictions one to 10 years ahead. And we use these large ensembles because we know we can get better skill when we're pooling together many members from many different climate models. And what we're interested in looking at is whether we're able to predict these fluctuations in the NAO because that can help us get better flood predictions. So we know that when the NAO shifts into a positive phase, we tend to see these stronger storm tracks across the North Atlantic, bringing more moisture across the British Isles. And in particular, in the winter period, this is what we're trying to predict. So what we did was um, here we're developing a simple statistical method and I'm going to first illustrate the, the broad concept of the method and then how we enhance those predictions. But we're using a statistical model because the, the decadal predictions are provided at the monthly time step and this is where it's given the amount of uncertainty in these types of data it actually makes sense to use a statistical or a machine learning method that's where we tend to get um, good skill using these simple methods. So our target variable is the winter floods. So we're actually looking at, I say floods as a shortcut, but it's actually the high flows. It's the 95th percentile of the high flows in the four winter months, December, January, February, and March. And I've made, we've made up this, this example. It's, these aren't real data. This is just to explain how it works. We imagine, for example, that we're in 2016. And what we want to predict is the mean high winter flow in the next four years. So 2017 to 2020. And that's our target variable. And to predict that, we're getting the predictors from this very large ensemble of CMIP5 and CMIP6 models. So we have those predictions, and we know that by increasing the ensemble size, we can increase the skill of the predictions. So we also take the lagged forecasts from the previous periods, which can be considered as a persistence forecast. And I should specify that all of this work was undertaken by Simon Moulds, who used to be a postdoc working with me here in Oxford on this question, who's now a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh. And so we have um, our large ensemble of predictions of precipitation and temperature. And the main challenge here is that there's a lot of uncertainty in these data. So how can we actually use them to generate a skillful flood prediction? If we look at the predictions of the NAO anomaly in the large climate ensemble, the CMIP ensemble, you can see that they have, the raw data has relatively little skill because even though it manages to capture the phase of the NAO correctly, the variance itself is, is inadequate. It's not really capturing the variance of the NAO fully. So this is a method that was developed by Doug Smith et al at uh, the Met Office. And we, we use their method uh, to improve the skill of the predictions. So here what's happening is the, the ensemble itself is being adjusted, the variance is being adjusted, and you can see that the, the mean of the ensemble matches the observations much better once this uh, approach is applied. And then we ap apply their NAO matching technique, which is that we select the top 20 members that then best match the adjusted variance of the NAO from the large multimodal ensemble. And we can use this then to improve our um, this approach, the top 20 uh, members from the large ensemble to improve our temperature and precipitation predictions. So you can see that once you've applied the NAO matching technique, um, you can generate much more skillful predictions of temperature and precipitation. And I should specify that this is done really independently. We've got the training and the testing periods, which are completely independent, which means that it, it works in an operational forecasting scenario. And so we use these predictions of temperature and precipitation as input to our statistical model. So in this case, it was a distributional regression method, but we've used, we tried different methods. We've also been using machine learning as well. Um, and we see how this improves the skill of our predictions of um, high winter flows in this case uh, for two gauges in Scotland, which have a very strong um, association between stream flow and the NAO. Um, and you can see if we look at the raw predictions that are generated using the full ensemble in green, they tend to have relatively limited skill. But when we use the NAO matched ensemble to drive that model, to, to build our, our statistical model, we tend to have skillful predictions of winter flows, high flows. Um, and we're looking really at predicting these high flow periods uh, in the coming four years ahead. So we think that this has considerable potential. And it has potential not just for the UK, because in this case, we're using um, the NAO, but you could think of, of developing a tailored procedure which would select the climate oscillations that matter for a given gauge in a given part of the world if you had the time and resources to do something like this. And so we think this has a lot of potential. 
So I also, I wanted to say thank you to the NRFA more generally, because um, in preparing for this talk back in the summer, um, I looked through all of the papers that we'd produced in recent years, and I thought, which which of these um, are really, have, wouldn't have been possible without NRFA data. And it's, it's a large fraction of the work that we do. Um, as um, Jamie was saying right at the beginning, ranging from the very local studies all the way through to the global studies that are building on GRDC data, all of this draws on, on the NRFA. So um, yeah, all of our research wouldn't be possible without the NRFA. So I have a big thank you to say. So to conclude, um, we think the NRFA is a really invaluable resource uh, for the work that we do in Oxford in understanding how the water resources are changing, how they're affected by different drivers. I haven't had the time to go into this, but this is a whole area of our research, understanding what it is that's driving changes in floods, and also looking at how they might evolve into the future, because we can't develop our predictive models without the observations as well. So thank you very much from me. I'll stop sharing, it's my mouse works. Thank you very much, Louise. That was a wonderful talk. And I think, yes, Jamie's saying here online, fantastic talk. Uh, and great to see the list of papers. <laughs> that was an impressive list and probably fell off the bottom of the screen as well. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, I don't know if we've got any other hands up or questions for you. Yep, Duncan's got one for you. Duncan, would you like to come online? I can see the question. <laughs> <laughs> We haven't done the analysis for the next four years, no. We were using the data that were made publicly available. So what we would need to be able to generate the uh, you know real operational forecasts would be to have access to real-time data. But it's absolutely possible. <laughs> Thanks, Duncan. Oh, brilliant. Oh, brilliant. Right. I don't think there are any more questions for you at this stage, but if people um, think of questions after we've finished, I'm sure um, our speakers today would be very happy to answer them for anybody uh, at any point during the, this uh, presentation mm -hmm. session. Isabella, we have a question from Jamie, I think. Do we? Right. Yes, yeah. you're right. Oh, it was only a, it was, I put it in the chat because I, I, I thought we might be about to end. But I thought it was a question for Louise who could pick up on another time, but I, I, I can't remember whether we talked about this when you came to visit here uh, last year, but um, it always strikes me that some of the work we've done at the larger continental scale has really shown the, um, the importance of the AMO um, in driving flood variability. And I, because that evolved so slowly but for your sort of decade or prediction, I wonder whether that would be something worth looking at. There's an interaction with the NAO anyway, but I just wonder whether that's something you had done or considered. Yeah, we haven't done it. Um, we really just spent one year on this decadal project and we really just focused on the NAO for that. But I mean, it might be worth trying and having a look. It's a nice idea, um, especially moving beyond the UK to other parts of the world. I've also got a question from Trevor. Trevor, do yeah, you want... I can yeah. read that if you want. Um, I just wondered quickly, as we near the end, can the general public and journalists, crucially, be educated in the science of uh, such predictive techniques? It's a good question. Uh, I mean, the, the science is publicly available now. All, all UK funded research is, is made publicly available. So the method is out there. Um, I'm always happy to answer emails. Um, yeah, I, I mean, we, we just showed that it's possible. It's it's not been taken up operationally because at the moment, I don't think there really is much demand for this. People aren't saying, can can you tell us, are we moving into um, a flood rich or a flood poor period? Um, but I think what we wanted to do was say this is possible and it, it's something that decision makers might be interested in. Uh, look, we can do it. And this is even, this is the first attempt at doing it. We can do even better than that. Um, yeah. Thanks very much. That's great. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, 
Trevor for that question and Louise for that answer at the end there. And if I may, um, I, I when back in my student days, I was always fascinated by the teleconnections topic and so and so on and, and North Atlantic oscillation. But Jamie's reference to AMO, thinking about some of those decision makers who aren't here necessarily, um, but may watch this video. What does AMO stand for? I can guess the O is the oscillation and A may be... Uh, it's in the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. So okay. it's a slower um, evolution in uh, sea surface temperatures in, in the Atlantic, but it has a does have a really big bearing on um, European weather in general. And because it's, I mean, there's been quite a few papers that have looked at it. Um, and, and interestingly, it has an impact on the summer as well. So it's not, the NAO is very much like a winter phenomenon, but the AMO has a, has a sort of, impact uh on the summer in the northern latitude so there's lots of interest in it and um yeah it's like a the 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 nao is influenced by the state of the amo they both interact but it's um yeah just another one of those oscillations there's a whole laundry list of them all out there indeed so. i was, I was going to say other oscillations are available so uh, thank you very much, Jamie, for that. Um, sadly, I think we need to bring things to a close uh, because we're approaching two o'clock. Um, so um, Victoria, we might have today's programme back on screen, but that's not absolutely necessary. Um, but summing up as chair of Saga, um, and also personally, I'd say it's been absolutely terrific. And I think on behalf of the Saga committee, it's, you know, we've been thrilled and, and inspired, I think, to have this opportunity with all the wonderful presenters and the great questions and all your participation uh, to mark this 40th anniversary of the archives, both the, the National River Flow Archive and the National Groundwater Level Archive. So again, a thank you, a huge thank you to British Hydrological Society for hosting us today, and indeed to the Geological Society for hosting the, the NGLA presentation in May. Um, Isabella, what do you think? I'm sure you agree. Absolutely, it's been wonderful, a great success today. And it's all down to the calibre of our presenters and to you for all our um, for your participation in our webinar. So I think we should give our presenters a big round of virtual applause. <laughs> thank you, everyone. And um, thank you to Victoria for hosting us today. And so I'd just like to hand back to you to close our, our webinar. Great. Thank you, Isabel. And uh, Paul, yeah, it's been a really good webinar today. So uh, thanks to everyone for joining. And um, this has been recorded. So and it will be uploaded to the YouTube channel for the BHS in the next couple of weeks. So yeah, thanks to everyone.